You're listening to Reach MD, and this is Lipid Lumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, your host, and joining me today is Janet Maxson, who's a Ph.D. in nurse practitioner. Dr. Maxson is president-elect of the Midwest Lipid Association and director of women's health at Minot Health and Wellness in Minot, North Dakota. She's board-certified family nurse practitioner by the American Nurses Association. She's also a fellow of the American Heart Association, Council of Cardiovascular Nursing, and the National Lipid Association. I should point out that we're broadcasting live today from Lipids Throughout the Lifetime, which is the National Lipid Association's clinical lipid update meeting in New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, so that explains some of the background noise as people here are excited about the, uh, the meeting. We hope that members of our audience will come to these meetings in the future, which are a great way to learn about lipids, and also it gives me the great opportunity of gathering national experts for these interviews. So our topic today is going to be broken hearts or broken bones, and we're going to focus on calcium supplementation, when they should be taken, and the issue that a lot of patients have concerns about, whether taking calcium has an effect on their heart, and how to balance that against the potential for fractures. So, Janet, thank you very much for joining us today and taking time out of the meeting to talk to us. And I guess let's start with the obvious question. What should we tell our patients about whether calcium supplementation is good for you or bad for you? Well, broken ho- hearts or broken bones seems to be the hot topic these days, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Um, I think the most important calcium women have is natural in, the, in their diet. So if they can have low-fat, healthy dietary intake that has calcium and read their labels, I think it's important as opposed to depending on a supplement. Studies have shown that the absorption of supplements is not the same as when we take it in the natural form. So uh, what about some of the newer studies suggesting that women who take calcium supplementation might be at higher risk for heart disease? Is there anything to that? Well, the Nurses Health Study tells us women are taking calcium that had gone up from 30 to 72 percent, and the studies out there vary. There was a recent journal in the um, British Medical Journal that talked about it was a mammography study, a Swedish study that looked at um, 19,000 women, no, 61,000 women, and it was over a 19-year period, and they did have higher cardiovascular disease in the women who took over 1,400 milligrams in a day, but not so in that group that took um, 600 to 1,000, but it was also higher in the group that was under 600 milligrams a day. So well, how does that make sense? Yeah, that too much calcium is going, going somewhere. What are the other risk factors that those women have for heart disease? What are their sources of calcium? What is their lifestyle? You know, as usual, the risk factors that are shared between people with osteoporosis are like risk factors for heart disease, the smoking, the inactivity, the poor nutrition. So if you were going to make a recommendation to your female patients who are worried about osteoporosis, what do you tell them? Um, I tell them to take it naturally and have low fat, but if you look at who's giving the recommendations, the um, Institute of Medicine recommends that women have postmenopause 1,000 to 1,200 a day. So that's a good point to start at. And then also the vitamin D is also a big issue. I think um, as we get more and more research on the vitamin D, it's going to be an impact. I live in North Dakota, and so everybody up there above the 37th parallel, you know, we don't, we don't see sunshine. And about five years ago when we started looking at the vitamin D, that impact that it has on on bones we've known forever. I mean, there's a reason they put uh, 400 units in cod liver oil back in 1947. So that's what we went on till it was the Institute of Medicine's research that that showed the changes in other aspects. And then after we broke down the genes and and mapped all our genes, they have found that there are 2,000 genes that don't function properly with lack of vitamin D. So it it is a big issue. So I think with vitamin D right now, when you look at the clinical endocrinologist and the the National Institute of Osteoporosis, they're recommending 1,000 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day. And, of course, that would be adjusted in those patients who are found at very low levels of vitamin D, correct? Yeah, yeah. right now the recommendations, and, and I, I do check women's vitamin Ds, and if they have any chronic disease, I check it, else I just make sure and ask them what their, their baseline is. And in the last five years that I have checked, it is so rare for having somebody at a level. And there's even studies now that show that HDL goes up when their vitamin D level goes up, so it also has an impact on other metabolic processes. 
I should point out to our audience that there have been some small studies suggesting that people who are vitamin D deficient might be a little more prone to statin myopathy also. I think those have been controversial, but uh, not super scientific, but some evidence that if you replace the vitamin D in some of those patients, they may be more tolerant of statins. So I don't know whether that's real data or that's just noise, but it's another excuse to, to check vitamin D in patients and replace it particularly in those who are having trouble with their statins. Yeah, and, and even looking at now with the topics of, um, you know, through the lifetime, which is the main topic in women, you know, they actually the study was done at the University of North Dakota that showed changes in the placenta with low vitamin D levels, so that being an impact. So I tell my patients, and I, and I check them, the guideline that I go by for every point that they're under 30 is the recommendation is that should be 1,000 IUs per vitamin D to replace to get up to 30 as a base for international units as, as a guideline. So I do that for two months, and I check their levels, and then I put them on a maintenance dose, except with the obesity. Sometimes with the obese people, they, they lose so much of vitamin D into their fat, they need four times more vitamin D to get them up. We used to think that um, when you're obese, you're probably going to have good bone density, right? Well, that has proven to be false because we see more vitamin D deficiency actually in obesity. So you have to check those those other women that have, you know, body habitats that's quite large too because I do have women who have severe osteoporosis who are overweight. Very interesting. I just want to reassure you, since you're my close friend, that even in Chicago, we don't get a lot of sun. So it's even North, North Dakota is bad, but... We're equally bad. So let me ask you about some of the screening guidelines in terms of screening women for bone density. What, what would be the current recommendations in the context of worrying about coronary artery disease, bone density, et cetera? Well, if I had my um, say of, of health care, I would like women to be screened for cardiovascular disease. You know, women get a mammogram. 77% of women get a mammogram just for the breast cancer screening. It does nothing about prevention for breast cancer. Okay, if we could get women to get a calcium score, what, what is a calcium score? You know, the FRAX um, um, recommendation, which is the a World Health Organization and the um, Osteoporosis Association, set that up in 1994 as a screening um, guideline. So it, you can go online very easily for your patients and put in their numbers and see what the risk for is for um, a fracture, just like we do Reynolds risk score and we do the Framingham risk score on our women. So you do that, it also looks at their age, if they smoke, if they had family history of osteoporosis, if they're on steroids, anybody who's on more than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone, that being an issue, other inflammatory diseases, you put in all the numbers and then you can see what they need to be um, scored at and if they need to have an earlier um, DEXA screen done. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and I'm speaking with Dr. Janet Maxson, president-elect of the Midwest Lipid Association and the director of women's health at Minot Health and Wellness in Minot, North Dakota. Let's talk a little bit about hormones. We've talked about calcium, and I'm going to bring you back to that before we finish, okay, because I, I want you to give a simple answer to the, all our doctors in the audience about what they should do with calcium supplementation. But uh, let's talk about hormone supplementation. And I think, you know, with the HERS data suggesting that maybe women with established coronary disease might be at higher risk with at least estrogen-progesterone combination, uh, how do you handle that? And when, when uh, women come in and say, I'm having menopausal symptoms, what should I do? And those who are not having menopausal symptoms but who are curious about the benefits of postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. Well, women tend to lose right at that perimenopause, menopause, 2 to 4% of their bone density per year. Then after that, it does slow down. But if they have poor diet, you know, they smoke cigarettes, that, that's also an impact on what's going to accelerate their bone loss. So what, what I tell them, you know, we are not supposed to use estrogen for osteoporosis prevention. So they ha you have to look at the other guidelines of what they're going to do, weight-bearing exercise, quit smoking, you know, follow a, follow a healthy diet. The, the estrogen issue is a, is a huge issue, and um, since I deal with women and I practice all day long, you know, treating those vasomotor symptoms is crucial to get them through that. And right now, the studies with the cardiovascular disease, you know, if we are doing interventions right more at the perimenopause as opposed to the WHI study where we waited 10 years after and even longer, where there's already those complex cardiovascular issues going on and unstable plaque, 
those those issues have changed. I've been practicing long enough where, yes, in, in back in the, the 90s, I could put somebody on um, estrogen on, on Premarin, which was the common one we used, and I could drop an LDL 60 points. Well, we don't do that now. What the WHI taught us is you get their lipids under control. If they need to do hormones, then you do the hormones secondarily so you don't um, disrupt that unstable plaque. Estrogen is our best friend. It's a, it's a wonderful vasodilator. That wonderful nitric oxide protects our endothelium wonderfully. Our HDL stays high. Our LDL, you know, stays, stays down. But, wow, we hit menopause, the bad goes up, the good goes down, and all the other issues that, you know, estrogen affects 400 receptors in our body. So it's still dicey. You know, it, it, we, not, we not only are not using estrogen to protect them from cardiac disease once they have established cardiac disease, but also for simply bone density. So is the major indication for just refractory perimenopausal symptoms? When is it okay to start estrogen replacement on a postmenopausal woman? Well, I, I think it has to be a very personal decision, and that's, you know, the wonder that we could be as their, their, their health coach is you look at their risks, you look at the benefits, you look at how, what type we're doing now. I think we've transitioned into much more topical so that we have good end studies now on some of the topical, whereas previous, you know, studies were more so on the oral and that going through the liver, that, that secondary, you know, pathway. So I do use a lot of hormones in my practice and keep my women happy. We monitor their lipids. You know, we monitor, monitor all their risk factors for the diseases that are associated with estrogen as well as what they have for cardiovascular disease. Do you think it was the progestins that were the issue in terms of the bad outcomes, or do you think, I mean, I realize that that study was in women who had uteruses, so they had to have both estrogen and progestins. Uh, some people think maybe that maybe it wasn't the estrogen, it was the progestins that caused the increased risk. Well, well, progesterone is, a, is an interesting hormone because, you know, progesterone actually will build your bones a little bit more with the presence of estrogen, whereas estrogen prevents the breakdown, you know, so you have prevention of the osteoclast part of it. You know, the, the end points between those women is, you know, debatable. You know, there's so many things that are just how do you study, make, set up a study to, you know, look at the specifics of that. But hormones are our friends. And um, as far as the risk for cancer, you know, the, the risk factors for cancer, we share, you know, women, smoking, inactivity, poor diet, you know, diabetes, diabetes. Women who have diabetes have more risk of um, um, cardiovascular disease as well as osteoporosis. So let me ask you a little bit about side effects, and let's get back to the calcium issue in the time that we have left. Um, any concerns about side effects from calcium, and, and uh, can you discuss, uh, after we talk about side effects, what should our audience do when they have a woman that has some osteoporosis and is asking them, what is my concern? Am I going to get heart disease from taking the calcium, or should I worry more about osteoporosis? Well, we have agents out there to treat osteoporosis, and we have good guidelines for those, too. But I tell my women, when they take their calcium, um, they shouldn't use coral calcium because they found a lot of contaminants in that. The calcium citrate is better. I tell them, as a reminder, don't buy the carbonate. Carbonate gas, it actually makes you have more gas and, and more problems with, con with constipation. So citrate is absorbed better. We also know with the studies that show on when we change the acid pH of the stomach that that has an impact on calcium absorption. So the citrate will absorb in the stomach whether you're taking an acid stopper, an H2 or a proton pump inhibitor. So you'll get better absorption. You probably should take it later in the day. And the important thing is, especially if they look at too much at one time, because you can only absorb calcium so much at one time, is to split the doses. So often on the calcium supplements, two of those big, huge capsules will equal a dose. And I always tell my women, just take one at a time and split them. Don't take them all at once. Okay, so now I'm your patient, and I'm telling you that I'm concerned because I read something in the local newspaper that calcium is going to cause me to have a heart attack, but yet I've got osteoporosis, and I'm worried about uh, not having vertebral and lumbar fractures when I'm older. Mm -hmm. uh, what should I do, doctor? Yeah. Well, since there are um, 2 million fractures a year, and in women, 80% are in women, only 20% are in men, Dr. Brown, you're probably pretty safe. But um, 
I tell them to look at their dietary intake and try to get into the baseline, whether it's the good low-fat foods and, and a supplement. I make sure their vitamin D, I always check their vitamin D level. And in some of those women, there's other metabolic issues going on, parathyroid glands, some of those things that we always have to rule out. But I tell them split their dose. Um, don't go all out and buy all these supplements. You know, there are so many people think supplements that it's the panacea of things getting better, but exercise and weight bearing is still a, a good thing. Um, good nutrition, and of course, not smoking because smoking binds to the estrogen and, and has an impact on bone um, reproduction and build up and break down. And just, you know, be the advocate for their health, you know, that we all need to be advocates for our health. You know, we're just the coaches. We give them guidelines. And, of course, now we know we only give three hits at a time, learning that we're giving too much information to our patients. Yeah, so finally I'm going to ask you, okay, I want to get my calcium more from diet than from pills because I'm still nervous about this article I read today in the newspaper. So uh, what would you tell them specifically about things they should do to increase their calcium intake naturally but in a healthy way okay well you can have four cups of broccoli to one glass of milk so that would be a good supplement um, you can go online that's the wonderful thing about the internet and put in calcium and your fish of course your fish are wonderful and there's a few studies out there that actually say the impact of omega-3 on the stem cell that reverts back to help with bone growth so that that'll be things in the future that they'll maybe look at in some of the research projects um, people who are Northern European, they, they tend to grow pretty big and they didn't drink milk, so living off the, the sea with fish is not a bad thing. All right, well, that's great. Well, Janet, thank you very much for being with us today. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I really appreciate your insights on calcium supplementation, the positives and negatives, and also uh, your discussion about vitamin D and screening patients for uh, osteoporosis. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and you've been listening to Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at reachmd.com lipids, featuring podcasts of this and other series. And thank you very much for listening.